So this was a practice question. They give you accounting records of Able Limited. That's the company that you're working with. For the month 31 July 2013 and 31 August 2013. Cool. So this is the information related to July. This is the information related to August. What we have here is the sales for the month. They give you the units and the total value. They gave you production for the month of July. And they told you that finished units at the beginning of the month was zero. So we didn't have any opening inventory. Variable production cost per unit, they give it to you. And variable sales and admin cost per unit is three rand. Fixed production cost 4.6. And then the fixed selling admin, which is 3.1. Then August, same thing. They give you sales. They give you the units. They give you the selling price per unit. Unlike this side, this side, it's the total sales. Then they give you the production for the month. And the variable cost per unit, variable for sales and admin per, per unit, and the fixed cost. A bit straightforward in terms of the information. So let's hear what they say. Additional information is that you using first in, first out. Oh, yes, that's what we used. Yesterday, we also looked at how what is the impact of the valuation method on these both, uh, both methods, right? The direct and absorption. The question that we did yesterday it was weighted average, but then today's one, which was the homework, it is using first in, first out to evaluate their stock. The increase in fixed production cost is due to a new rental agreement with respect to the factory. So they're explaining why your fixed production is not the same as last month. Because we know that with fixed costs, they say the same. Rental stays the same month to month. So now the increase between the two is because they entered into a new lease agreement with respect to the factory that they're using. Then they told you that there were no stock losses during any of the two months. All right, so I think you have a holistic view of what's happening here. What you were asked to do is to prepare an income statement under direct costing method, and then the other one was absorption costing method. Then you were asked to um you must clearly illustrate the difference between the two so you need to make sure that whatever framework that you do we can see the difference between a direct costing and an absorption costing then they ask you to reconcile the difference in profits according to the two methods that's the recon part so this is what you needed to do. Which ones are given? Start with the easy marks. Then the parts that you know that are going to be tricky, you do them at the end, and that's where you're going to spend your time because you would have saved time by getting the easy marks. Then that's where you sort it out. And then now you go back to say, okay, fine, but now they have a normal loss and an abnormal. How do I treat it? Sometimes they might spin you and give you the allocation situation ABC versus traditional. You need to then put it in your thought to say, okay, but then under this topic, where does this fit in my income statement? Then you slot it there. But yeah. start with the basics, start with the easy marks, then build up on it because principles are the same, no matter how they test it. Okay. Then another framework that's introduced is reconciling between the two income statements. You guys said that you didn't have time to get to B. So you see it's three marker and it's very simple marks, but we don't want you to lose those three marks, right? Because it was 18 minutes. I mean, um, it was 18 plus three multiplied by 1.2. So you're supposed to spend 25 minutes. So someone said that they spent 18 minutes on A. So that means that you should have had time to get to 
be. Because B is only three minutes, eh? Because you are taking information from up. So if you were someone, remember yesterday we were saying you put your, your structure without the numbers in. You put the structure for direct, you put the structure for absorption. When you know the structure for reconciling between two income statements, put it there to say net income from direct, net income from absorption. What will be that difference? Then you say opening stock, closing stock, direct absorption, direct absorption. By the time you see that time is running, once you got your opening stock, put it there, 540. Absorption cost, put it there, 1000. You put there, because you've already calculated from there, from here. Then what will be remaining is just to add up and see if this thing actually reconciled. But probably you will get principal marks for knowing that for doing a recon between two income statements, you need to show the movement between the opening stock under these two methods and the movement of the closing stock under these two methods. It will give you the net income. So what I'm saying is don't get into a situation whereby you are losing three marks. You must now I'm introducing another thing to say. Let me in this the, the frameworks. Yes, opening stock might give you a problem, closing stock might give you a problem, but put the structures in place so that you can write and maximize on getting your marks. Done saying I didn't attempt it at all. All right. Any questions? Can I quickly just ask? Yes. The question says reconcile the difference in profits according to the two methods. Mm. Pardon? I think I've lost you. Hey? Hello? Sorry. The, the question says Hi. reconcile oh. the difference in profits according to the two methods. Yes. But you, but you, the, the the reconciliation you showed now was the net income, not the profits. Net income is profit, Selma. Thank you. <laughs> yes, sorry. Net income is profit. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you know what? Uh, with me, with with me. Hey, I got everything right now, but. Uh, I still have a challenge with uh, opening uh, the closing inventory because of I have used uh, 200 divided by uh, 1,000 times the the, the uh, variable manufacturing cost. But I see here they've said 200 times 650. I still get confused on when do I have to divide the the, the Closing stock with the available uh, available units for sale, when, or when must I just take the 200 uh, closing stock and multiply by variable price? So I don't know, like how to get it without even getting confused. Do you get okay. me? Um, yeah, yeah, and then the second one. Uh, Every, I also got it wrong when it comes to, op with that one, opening uh, inventory and closing inventory, both of them, I didn't get them right. Because of, I don't even know how did you get this 10,000 and this 11,844. For yeah. like the 10,000 10, for opening stock, I don't know where it comes from. And then the, Closing stock, the 11,844 on calculations. I, I'm not sure how how they got that one. Okay. Cool. I hear you. It looks good okay. here. Oh, first question first before we get to the 10,000 and the what got you. Is that... Okay. Um, First question is when do we do weighted? I mean, like taking your closing stock over this, multiply by that. And yes. when do we do the 
straight closing stock, like just calculating it straight. Do you guys know? Yeah, that's why I don't get it right. I, like, yes, I'm, yes. Confused. I'm just throwing it in the class. Do you guys know? Why do we apportion here while here we've just calculated straight? What do you guys think? It's a first-in, first first-out method, obviously. And you're going to yeah. actually evaluate where your closing stock will come from last year's cost, right? Mm. And, um, no, sorry, your opening stock comes from last year's cost. Your closing stock will come from current year's production. Yes, but she's asking, do you, and why is it that when we're doing our closing stock, under absorption costing method, we have to apportion this cost. But when we are under direct costing method, we just calculate 200 multiplied by 600. Oh, because of the fixed production cost. Yes, correct. Sorry. So, Yes, no, no worries. You are still correct to, to, to highlight the other one. But you are correct. The reason why, under you were asking when do I, let's make sense out of it. Direct costing method, you don't have fixed cost included. Hence, it's 200 multiplied by 650 straight. There's no other cost except this variable production cost. But, when it comes to uh, absorption costs, this 11,844 includes both variable and fixed. So you have to make an up, and it was for the total production for this current month. So you have to apportion it to get the portion only for closing stock. That's why you are taking closing stock over the total production for this current month. Because this, you, like with like 11,844, it was for producing 900 units. How did they get these 11,844? Is the 5.850 plus this 5.9? Because it's cost for this month. This 1,000, it's for the previous cost, the previous month's cost. Do you get what I mean? So you can't. Oh yeah, now I, I think I. Yeah, so you can't put eleven eighty four here. You have to a portion, get a portion of it, because this eleven eighty four was for the nine hundred, which is here. It's here. It's eleven forty four, but we are portioning it because it it includes both variable and fixed and it was the total but now i just need it for closing stock while as here no matter what whether the units are 900 or 800 this is per unit it's a variable rate it doesn't include fixed it's per unit so that means that even if it was a thousand or whatever it's per that unit you don't need to apportion it but this is a total value for 900. If you want it to be slick, you'll say, I'll say 1184 divided by 900 to get the cost per unit, then multiply it by 200. That's what you're doing. It's just that here you're just making it straightforward like this, the percentage of that to this. So are we together? Same thing with the opening stock. Why are we apportioning it here as opposed to this side where it's just direct 5 rand, 5, 5 rand 40? You have to apportion it because this 10,000 is for the previous production, which is July. I'm not sure whether it's at my network this side or what. Can you guys hear me? Hello? Hello? Yes, yes. That I understand how you... how. So why do we have to apportion it? It's just that I wasn't uh, sure when to yeah. apportion it and then when not to apportion it. But now I understand because the direct costing, we only deal with variable, like the production side. Yes. We only yes. deal with variables. 
uh, variable production, not both of them. So I, I do get it right. I'll, I'll and, look at it now. Yes, and you must also understand that this apportionment changes when you're using weighted average, right? You must always remember. With weighted average, we said it's not only production, it's the cost available for sale. Yeah. And your amount here, it's the cost available for sale cost. So I would advise you to know the difference between a weighted average method and a first in first thing, a first in first out valuable um, method. How do I treat it when I'm doing my absorption cost? How do I do it so that you understand that with weighted average, we didn't say first thing first out says that we firstly need to sell this 100 units before we get to anything else. But with weighted average, it says whether it's that 100, whether it's the production for this month, whether we sold something, whatever that's the balance, we need to weight against that. So I would advise before you get into the exam, go and look at those principles so that you understand. Right now you have an understanding why do we do this division and why do we have these amounts? But now you need to understand why are we using 200 here? And when we are looking at weighted average, it will be a different amount here. It will be a different amount here. You need to understand why. When you understand the why, okay, yeah, it's a weird uncertainty. Yes. All right. Today's topic. I did say in the WhatsApp group to say that we will look at ABC after covering this. I just felt like uh, job costing and process costing is quite a lot to cover. So let's try to also push a big one. ABC, we will do it. Um, the allocation situation is very quick. So I think we can, uh, let's see how today goes. Then the Saturday class, we'll see how, what to start with and stuff. So today, please bear with me. I know you guys went to another class. You just from work, went to another accounting class, and you're still getting information overload. I'm sorry, today's one, it's going to be a bit of more theory as opposed to just doing questions because I need to make sure that we cover the principles first. So please do bear with me. I'm just warning you now. <laughs> and please don't sleep because I'll be asking you questions. So there's going to be a bit of exercises, a bit of examples, and then, yeah, we should be fine. So, yes, we're doing job costing system and a bit of process costing because job costing is a bit quick then we'll get into a bit of process costing with job costing by the end of reading a unit for job costing you will be able to identify job costing system which one is appropriate when do you use it and when is it appropriate to be used we look at recording costs for job costing system and calculating the profit and loss. Like I said, it's a very short topic, but you must know because you find that sometimes these short topics, they come out in multiple choices. And multiple choice means that you must know your story, must be able to pinpoint the option that is correct. Um, product costing. Okay, so this is the costing system, describes the job costing and the flow of documents within job costing system and the flow in the ledger in terms of how do you recognize that uh, manufacturing cost. Cool. So product costing system represents a quick method where you are doing, you're looking at the manufacturing cost of a single job or a single product. So the purpose of calculating the unit cost of a product or a job is uh, very crucial because you are able to claim the cost directly whatever single product that you have post produced right so two groups of product costing systems it's number one job costing or process job is normally for a single product 
processes for multiple or different processes or group or to get. So maybe I may ask you guys, hopefully you've covered a bit of job costing. What type of product would you say that uh, job costing would be relevant to use for capturing or tracing your manufacturing costs? What type of product comes to your mind? A wedding dress. Ooh, okay. But what type of a wedding dress now? <laughs> but I'm just thinking of a store. No, a wedding it's, no, it, it, um, one made specifically for you to your specifications. So it's specific material and cuts and color. And so it's very, very specific. It's not a one that you would buy at a store. Yeah, so it's like a tailor-made whatever label or you find that, that there's a specific designer, you know. People, I don't know if you watch the Met Gala, but you find that whoever the fashion designer is would make a particular dress, like you said, for the artist. You would not see it on the runways. It was specific and tailor-made for their body, right? Um, another example... For job costing is uh, private banking. Uh, okay, job costing. I've never looked at that. No, I wouldn't say it, it's not once off. It has to be like specialized and once off. But with private banking, it you you have so many people who use that very same product. I'd say maybe not private banking, it might have to be, if it's within a banking uh, sphere, it would have to be like one of the top notch, probably don't even know that product for wealth people. Because oh. I, I work at a bank, people living at the, who are from wealth, they don't use the same escalators, same lift as us. They've got a special lift for them, we don't even see them. So I'm just saying, if I can't even see the client, chances are there's certain products that they You have. must be with R&B then. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying that probably we don't even know the certain products for those wealth people. You know, I'm just thinking it has to be like top tier where not everyone will have it. So um, a private jet, you know, um, Cars, you find people saying that I want a Lamborghini that's pink, that has um, Debele writings inside, that has, you know, it's a situation where you find that, yeah, I'll make an example. I don't know if you guys follow art, but there's Nelson Makamu. He, he did a collab with Porsche and they put part of his painting inside the car. It's a one limited car. We're not going to get it. It's for him. They made it specially for him. It was a collaboration. People asked, can we order or what? They just said, no, it was only special and it was a one-off thing. It's unique. You wouldn't find a car that has painting um, inside by the door, by the mirror. You, I'm, I'm just giving you examples. So something like that. To where it's for a particular client. All right, so that's where job costing is job costing the market like i said it's specific to one person there won't be any replication of that product okay and the production like i said it's specialized it's not continuous it's not something that can be replicated it's specified special for that person and it's unique so it's not just a typical wedding dress you won't find it anywhere else. They'll say limited edition, but sometimes that limited edition is for one person. Okay. It doesn't have to be like luxury, luxury, and you think all luxury products are job costing. No. It's particular client, specialized, once off, and unique. Those are the characteristics of using job costing. Process costing. Yo, mass is mass, mass, mass production. 
you know, um, mass productions, general market is continuous, homogeneous. They all look alike. The BMWs, they all look alike. I'm not good with cars, but you'd find multiple of them. The Polos, they are even distributed worldwide. So that means that the production that they have, it's a continuous one. They know that after brushing it here, it goes from there. It's very machine, in, machine intensive, not crafted. I'm not saying that you find that the, um, the sometimes you find that at Woolies, they'll say handcrafted. It doesn't mean that that's drop costing. The fact that there's hundreds of stuff that are handcrafted doesn't mean that it's drop costing. It might be that it's just, uh, they're just putting in that thing. It's a value perception marketing tool that they're using where you feel a bit special, but it's still continuous. They all look alike. Job costing, different, tailor-made, tailor-made to the T. Can't be replicated for another person. Okay, I think so a typical example for process costing will be in your food uh, production systems, and it'll yes. be like clover, your dairies, your multiple, multiple grains, etc. Everyone has Danone. Danone is in strawberry. It's in. It's that everyone has it. It's it, the minute that you can globalize it and put it everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's no longer exclusive. Everywhere. Mm. So that process costing. There's a process <coughs> continuous, they all look alike. Okay. Then and uh, what about uh yeah, yeah. yes what about the, the dealership? Like because of the uh, when you when I take my car for service, uh, is that uh, falls under job costing? Because of uh, remember it might be different. You, you might find that maybe my service is different from your service. Maybe uh, because car. of I'm using hand. Sorry? It's the same car. Probably. It's the same car. Yeah, they'll tell you on your, uh, where you take your car for service, they'll say we deal with Audi cars. Mm. That means that but they so, know. But some, but some of the dealers, you no, find that it, they can yeah, do maybe like Bosch, they can do, they do um, Toyota, Bosch, Audi, Toyota. they can do yes. uh, no, VW, they can do Hyundai. Yes. Uh, yes. How, how do they how do they process? Is it's it job costing job or is the process costing? Process. Jo no, no. I think you, let's uh, clarify that point. He's talking about a service. So service is unique, although it's the same card. They have to open up a job card because the spares will be different. The labor component will be different. But what I'm saying is that within that line of work, when it's the Toyotas, it's multiple. Although it's a service. But it's not It's not once off, though. You're going to come back, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. Service is continuous. It's not like a specialized type of service, guys. One minute it's the car, next thing is this, next thing. I'm just saying that hmm, the market is, yes, it's particular client, but it, it must be specialized, like it must be once off. Okay. It must be once off. Because you say that, okay, the Berlin also a hairstylist. I go inside the hair salon, one is doing dreads, one is doing colored, one one is doing uh, braids, one is... But I'm going to come back next month and do something. I don't know. Yeah, just thinking. It's not, not once off. I just want to clarify, if you look on so in, in, in the um, study unit guide that you've got as well, it says a common example of a business where job costing is applied is at a garage where repairs okay. are carried out on different vehicles and where the cost of the repairs to each vehicle or job is calculated separately. So what the first lady said would then it would be it would fall under job costing and not process costing. Mm. Even though you might do the service, you will come back in a year's time for another service. Um, the process falls under job costing. Okay, fair enough. 
but I, I wouldn't have thought of it that way. I, I wouldn't have thought of it that way. But take hey, fair enough, it's fine. I guess and then then that that means that hence I'm saying like so does it mean hair? So would it be that any service orientated where there's different services that job costing? I would, I, I would yes. think so would because say, if you today I would come for dreadlocks, as you would say, mm. and in a week's time I would come for a cut. It's a different service. It's a, mm. the, the dreadlocks were specialized. It was once off. Even if I come three months down the line, I will still be do dreadlocks again, but it might be pink ones and not the same color. So it's a specialized once off. So they're not making. 50 dreadlocks on one day. Uh, for me as a customer, it's a once or for a specialized project. I mm, guess so. Then I guess in the service, yo, we can go on and on. But I, I'm saying that means that in the service area, if there's a different service that you give to a particular client, then you're introducing yourself to job costing as opposed to process. Because now I'm thinking of McDonald's. There's different things on the menu. So hence I'm saying I can go on and on. Would it mean that they're using job instead of process? Yeah, yeah I think there, there is a combination at McDonald's. McDonald's will be when they process the burgers, that will be process costing because it comes mm. already pre-processed at the manufacturing plant. Yes. Yes. But when it comes to the retail center, it's a job costing because people are ordering various Different. meals. Yes. Mm -hmm. And there's yeah. a combination and it's and, and it's according to the customer specifics. So it starts as process. Yes. When they're yes. making the burgers and stuff, they all look the same. They are all done in a continuous manner. But the minute that they give you your order, you become a particular client. And it's then one it's a job. Yes. And it's unit, then it's a job. Hmm. Okay. I'm glad that we had this conversation because at least then we can see how at the beginning they might seem the same, but it's the final product where you will see that it's job. And now you have to treat it as a job as opposed to process. But process would be up until the point in time where now you have to start separating it. Okay, interesting. Thanks, guys. So job costing, I think we've we've explained it here. I'm not going to read that. The flow of documents between job costing a request is prepared. So there will be a request that you make for this specific order. So I guess it's the same. Think about it. Yeah, we can go. But I'm now thinking about the whole thing of when you are by a drive through you start making a request, and then they start issuing out that order, right? Then a production order, e.g. a job card, is opened where specific client posters have been printed. They initiate the work that needs to be done on the job. Then the resources used are the material requisition, labor time, overhead allocation system. Then the production costs are accumulated in the accounts department as job cards. For people who are studying auditing, very important that you know your documents flow because that's mm -hmm. where now we come and say, where are the controls? What do you check? What do you verify? These are the stuff. But anyway, it's not auditing, but I'm just saying, if you know these, you will see that they are the same even in auditing. Job card forms the basis for calculating the unit cost and valuing the closing inventory and cost of goods. Nice. So I'm hoping that even with the flow, with the examples that we were making, you will start now um, visualizing what they're mentioning here about the flow of documents that even when you're taking in the car services, as you guys said, you come in, you're making an, an order of saying that I need to do a service. The other one is saying I'm changing my brake pads. Already on that order form, they put in to say what type of materials are they going to need, 
and who will be putting in the labor. And then they start now making you making phone calls to say, ma'am, we also identified that this, this, that, and these are the costs that you need to pay. Then you will then specify and say, ah, uh-uh, I'm not ready to change this, change that one. To get you guys start to try visualizing that it's not too far remote from things that you experience, right? Then you will get a job card that will tell you that, all right, after everything that we've taken into account, let's pay us living down. Just making an example. Right. Then here is just an indication of the flow between direct material that by the time that they identify which material would they need, how does it go to this job one before it goes to job two? So when you look at job one, it will have your direct material, direct labor manufacturing overheads. All right, so it's just an illustration. That's the diagram is in page 210. I'm not going to do the example. We will do a question. So when to use the job costing system, it depends on the market, the production, and the product, where to use it, manufacturing enterprises, service enterprises, and consultancy. Interesting, right? Then the flow of documents are different according to the systems that, that are in place in these places. Then the flow of the ledger, you saw it as to how do you record your cost and calculate your profits. So what do I have here? Refer to question one and two. Let's look at question two because it seems a bit quicker as opposed to question one. So question two, it's BMX Limited. It uses a job costing system to accumulate costs for a tailor-made range of products. The normal average capacity is 5,000 labors per month, and the budgeted average manufacturing overheads is 175 per month. Overheads are allocated on the basis of labor hours. Very important that you know. Cool. So, so far, gave you budgeted average manufacturing overheads and the labors per month. Then in July, an order was received, job 103, to manufacture 250 units of item X. The costing section carried out the following calculation of the estimated direct cost of the completed job. So now they indicate what's the estimated to complete this job for the 250 units. So material is 131 per item and labor is, it takes 7.5 hours for one unit at 15 rand per hour. The following information for the actuals is available. Let's take, you, you see words as estimated, budgeted, please. Normal average capacity, please look at those. Then they tell you that the actual, all the material required to complete this was issued at 140 per item. However, only 200 were completed and transferred. Only 200. They wanted 250. A total labor hours of 1.6 were worked on job 103 in order to complete the 200. So this is the total number of hours. Manufacturing overheads for the month amounted to, this is the actual 192. In the course of the month, 5.6 labor hours were worked at 16 rand per hour. So it took 1.6, but here it is. For the month, 5.6 labor hours were worked at 16 rand per hour. Job costing system operates as follows. Units completed on any order are booked to completed inventory at estimated cost when they are completed. So they are saying that by the time that this thing is done, they are using estimated cost. Any inefficiencies where the actual cost is more than the estimated in the production of the completed, it is written off as a period cost. I hope you guys are taking notes. Then 
Work in progress for incomplete units is carried at actual. Interesting. And they ask you to calculate. Uh, the question that we are doing is inside your module. It's not in the practice question. I hope I've answered. Um, to, they ask you to calculate the estimated total absorption cost for job 103 and the cost per unit for item X. They ask you to prepare the whip and the total over and under. Interesting, it comes here, guys. So, this was question two. I'm just gonna go through it now. Um, just. So I hope you will be able to follow. This example is inside your module. And then we'll try find a practice question as usual. For you guys to do, but this is an example so that you follow what we just did now. OK, so they told you that it has to be estimated. So now you're estimating what would be your total cost. So when you're estimating, you're estimating on what was initially ordered? I hope you guys can see um, the numbers here. It's 250 and you're using estimated cost. So I just wanted to highlight that you are using estimated units. Then you get your total cost being 126 because you took into account material, labor, and overheads. Then your cost per unit is this 126 divided by the 250 then this is your estimated cost per unit. I hope you guys are all on the same page. Estimated total cost, you had to calculate your total cost, which is made up of material, labor, and overheads. And because it's estimated, make sure that it's on that 250. And thereafter, the question asked you for cost per item X, you had to take that 126 divided by 250 to get 546. Then with the work in progress account, they say that, so now material, they told Sorry. you that, yes. I just want to go back to labor, not uh, labor, sorry, overheads applied. And I think that's my uh, thorny issue all the time. So that 250 units times the seven and a half hours, that's the over, uh, that's the applied overhead rate times a 35 where do we get the 35 from okay, let's go change ah overheads applied did you get it yeah i got the rate but they said 1600 hours times 35 no sorry that's a work account i want to know where did they get that 35 from it's the budgeted Average manufacturing overheads of 175,000 per month divided by the normal average capacity labor hours of 5,000. Thank you. It's the estimated rate. That's 192 divided by 5,600. No, divided by 5,000. From where are we getting the 5,000? Here it is. The normal average capacity is 5,000. Aha, uh -huh. thank you guys. Asia. Thank you. No problem. Cool. So with the whip, they say actual cost incurred. They show the material, they show the labor, they show the overheads applied. It's applied. It's applied. Why? Because we used budgeted overhead recovery rate. Okay. Then the cost leisure, they show the material, the labor, what's the opening cost, what are the production inefficiencies. Inefficiencies comes because did we oversupply or undersupply, right? That's the inefficiencies. And then what goes to completed goods? And what's your tool? So this is like your T account. 
where is the oversupplied? Is uh, product inefficiencies, what's that 8.3? Ash. So the total actual cost is 116, less the closing inventory, less the allocated completed goods. Oh, this is the 8.3. So I just want to check the over and under. The over and under, they take the 5.6 hours multiply. So 5.6 is the actual hours, because remember, the normal average capacity was 5,000. So they take 5.6 multiplied by 35, which is the estimated rate, and they do it against the actual amount that was actually spent, and we oversupplied by 4,000. That was C. So you see that it can also come under job costing. Job costing, it's nothing scary. It's just a matter of being able to know what are they asking you. So far, it seems like your quotation for a job card, it is based on estimated. So therefore, just make sure that also your overhead is based on the recovery rate, 85. And then it's the WIP. Just know your T accounts you must have your material, labor, your overhead, opening, and your closing. And the production inefficiencies, we saw that it is based on the total cost minus the closing inventory and the completed goods. Then that's how you get your production inefficiency. I just want to check a question that we can do just to make sure that we are on the same page when it comes to job costing before I go to um, before I go to process costing. It's a simple question. Like I said, job costing sometimes it comes as multiple choice. So this is the October uh, 2013 question. Okay, cool. It's two marks. So being two marks, that's two minutes. Literally, just take two minutes. I'll read the question for you, but you have to tell me which one is not true. Jumbo Plumbing Services is in the process of implementing a costing system and requires the expertise of a management accountant. Their manager, P. Postman, approaches you for advice, which one of the following statements is not true about job costing? Okay, so let me just put it up here. So A says that job costing is appropriate where homogeneous products are manufactured using the same production facilities. B, job costing is appropriate where Heterogeneous productions, I mean, products are manufactured using the same production facilities. A common example of a business where job costing is applied is where a workshop where repairs are carried out on the different vehicles and where the cost of repairs to each vehicle is calculated separately. Job costing is not appropriate in industries where large quantities of similar products pass through a single process or conservative processes in the cost of production. Which one is not true? A. It's A. Which of the following is not true about job costing? And why are you saying it's A? Let me just make it fun so that we close it off. The word homogeneous means they all look the same, and that okay. is for process costing. Okay. Uh, is that what? Yeah, and what else? That it's the same and also same facilities. So it is a, you are correct. Okay. I'll try see in this practice questions if there's anything related to job costing, maybe something that you guys can look at. But so far, um, yo, I just went in straight. Eh? Yeah, like this. 
just to practice, right? So I'll give you like a question, yeah, question 11, so that you can look at in those practice, I mean, practice questions. I put it in the group, so you guys should have it. So just try do question 11 by yourself, just to make sure that you are comfortable with everything that relates to job costing. Deal? We're done with job costing. I think we, we discussed it at length. You guys should understand job costing. I am comfortable with how you guys are able to contextualize it and give practical examples. So now the biggest thing now to go through is process costing. We're not going to touch everything under process costing today because it's a big topic, but we can start, right? So let's go into it. So process costing, I like the fact that job costing at least introduces you to process costing and we've spoken of some examples that relates to uh, process costing. So this is just a view of also, it's the same thing of saying, knowing when to use process costing and production by a single process, how does it look like? You need to get the unit cost calculation for a single process. Then there's situations where the production is consecutive, so meaning it's one process after the other and after the other. So there's two or more processes involved, meaning in each process, there's a certain unit cost calculation that needs to be done. Then you need to understand recording process cost flows. How does it flow? in your GL, general ledger, and also how do you report the whole process cost flow? Just an overview that by the time you're done, you'll be understanding this. Then we did explain that process costing, certain products must be produced in a process, manufactured in a process. So with any process uh, system, there's inputs that needs to be uh, put into that process. There's someone who needs to work there, who uses electricity and machines in order to convert this product, I mean, this raw materials into something else. Then there's the part where sometimes the products that you get, they are partially completed, others are fully completed. Then you get your output. All of these things, they happen within a conversion process that takes place over time. What type of process would you guys give me as an example? Something that you do that's practical, that's part of a process, where you can identify the inputs, the labor and overheads, and partial or full and output that comes after that conversion process. What can you guys think of? It can be anything like shoes, Kids. handbags, clothing. Yeah. Making, Maybe take making, me through the whole making. process as to say, this is when the input will be there, this is when the labor, and just making a good example of a process. Okay. If you take Okay, let's take into making a dress. So your fabric goes in at the beginning. Okay, it's you know, your material is supplied. It goes through a cutting, cutting the design pattern. Then it goes for for stitching, where cotton is added on your machine. Then it goes to I don't know much, but I'm just gonna try. Then yeah. most probably after stitching, it's gonna go for hedging, and uh, then after edging, it's most probably gonna have Colors or sleeves or long sleeves, short sleeves or whatever. And after that, it goes for buttons, most probably labels. I'm just thinking what does a physical yeah. dress have, or whether it has glitter or whether it has stone studs, whatever. And then it goes into the final ironing and pressing and packaging. So, in a work in progress situation, maybe. The, at month end, it just stopped at cutting process or stitching process, so it's incomplete. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's a good one. 
it's a good one. It just it shows the whole process. So thank you for that one. And these units are identical and they are produced in bulk. So imagine those dresses, 100, 500 of them, you know? So they are all identical and they are produced in bulk. Okay, uh, production by means of a single process. The materials is issued, so 100% of the material cost is at the beginning. You haven't converted anything here, but the conversion process, that's where now you start looking at percentage of completeness. So each and every single stage, you should be able to see, okay, here we are 40% in, how much does it actually cost? Until to the point where it's 100% conversion cost and it's completed, okay? Simple one, making a cake. At the beginning, you have your flour, your milk, your sugar. At the beginning, eggs for others. Then what happens is that the conversion pro process comes to place. You take uh, one cup of flour, one cup of milk, half a cup of sugar, you start mixing, that's labor, or you start using those mixers, um, using electricity, mix the uh, dough smooth and what, what, I don't know how to bake, guys, but then, um, then you start putting into the oven, you know how long it needs to be in until it's brown, then before it becomes the final product, you want to put some icing, some people put cream, then you want to decorate it, put some sprinkles on it. It's still not yet complete. By the time you are done, that's the output. You say, then that's cake for whoever who made the order. So think of process costing in that, that there's raw materials at the beginning, there's the conversion process, where it's the machines, it's the oven, it's the person who's making all these products. And then you get the final product, which is an icing cake with some decorations on it. I did say, please bear with me. Might be a bit of theory today, but questions come. Uh, you will read this uh, to this uh, recording. So we need to learn how to calculate the average cost per unit. Uh, and it's very important so that you can see within each of the specific period, what are the accumulated costs at the end of that process? What is, how much does it cost me to make this cake? And how many units did I produce by the end of this? So maybe let's look at 14.1. What they're telling us is that you need to calculate the unit cost for this single manufacturing process. So Fizi Zua manufactures a Fizi drink in a single process and makes use of process costing. Management obtained the cost and unit data for March. And what do we have here? And there were no opening and closing web, web because remember, it won't be like a finished product, right? So you'll have your material, you have your labor, your overheads, you've got your total manufacturing cost. And they tell you that they produced 57,000 units. Question is, calculate the cost per unit for March. I like these steps. Never underestimate steps because steps help you to save time in exams. So they tell you using the method for the above, the cost per unit is calculated by taking your total manufacturing over the units produced because there's no opening or closing with. So you will say, all right, if that's the case, what's my total cost? It's the 285 that's given. What is my number of units that was produced? It's 57,000 it is given. You apply the method, it's five rand per unit. It's a single process. There's no, um, there's no opening or closing. So it's straightforward. Because whatever that you that you um, whatever that you incurred for that process is for that unit, so it's straightforward. So that's an example of a single 
straightforward um, process. Now we take things a bit. So now comes the place where process costing, they're asking you to now look at this figure. Let's look at it. So now when we have a consecutive process, we'll make an example of making ground coffee. It will start with process one, where you start roasting, roasting your beans, 13 degrees. You got your raw coffee from, yeah, you imported the coffee beans. So you get them, that's your raw material getting into the process. What is the process? You are roasting it, putting it into the oven, or I don't know, it's a pan, but you are roasting your beans. At the end, what you're getting is roasted beans. Then thereafter, in process two, you take those roasted beans as part of your, it's sort of like ingredients for process two. They are now roasted, you have to meal them. You get the meal, meal, milling of the beans. That's the process. Then you end up getting ground coffee. Still not done. By the time you get your ground coffee, you put it into process three, where you're filling and sealing the whole packaging. So now there's the ground coffee that comes into process three, and there's also fuel bags that get into process three. Then thereafter, probably there is a machine where you put in the ground coffee. It filters to make sure that it's proper, proper ground coffee with no ingredients that you got from the factory, fills it, seals, then the final product is your ground coffee. So do you see that there are three processes, consecutive processes, because you can't just sell ground coffee without filling and sealing it into a final product, right? So it's consecutive, goes from one process What's finished here goes here, and then it ends up fil filtering through other processes until you get to the final product. So that's a consecutive process costing. So in such, in each of the processing, there's material, there's labor, there's overheads, material, labor, and overheads, material, labor, and overheads, until it, got, it gets to the final product. So that's process costing under a consecutive um process right so let's go to the activities then we're wrapping up the class we'll look at 14.2 and then 14.3 i'll see i just need the self-assessment then you will do the self self-assessment for me Cool, perfect. Uh, 14.2. Let's do example 14.2 together. So here's a consecutive process. We still need to get the unit cost in a system or within a consecutive process. So pe petrol core manufactures aeroplane fuel in four consecutive processes and they use process costing. The following cost data, we got it for June. They tell you material added in process one. I mean, in, in all the process, so as you can see, it comes in process one and then comes in process four. Then labor cost, they tell you, as you can see, we use more labor in process one as opposed to at the end. Then they give you the overheads that are allocated to each. So you can see that process two actually has high overheads allocated to it. The output at the end of this is 250 kiloliters of production. They ask you calculate the cost per kiloliter after completion of the processes. So let's look at it. So it tells you Process one, do we have any cost from the previous? No, this is the first process that we're doing. 
then you put in all your materials there and your labor, you get 50,000. Right? Then from here, it goes to process two. You need to take this 50,000 and you transfer it as part of cost from the previous processes. Put it in, we don't have material here, you get 86, you roll it forward to three until it gets to four, then it's one dead. Then you get your cost per limited, sorry for your name, cost per limited uh, per kiloliter. Altogether, I think it's pretty much straightforward. So can I give you guys a chance to do the self-assessment based on what we covered? Like today, it was literally just the basis of process cost. And we're going to get into detail of normal losses and and end probably on saturday so let's do self-assessment you guys will attempt and then you'll tell me the process how did you approach the question and how did you get your, your answer so clean core manufactures a household cleaning agent in two consecutive processes namely mixing and heating the chemicals and then Packaging the cleaning liquid, which is what they are selling. So the following data that they have, they give you for process M and H. This is where they are heating and mixing the chemicals, and process P is when they are packaging the cleaning liquid. So you have the material bought and issued, you have the conversion costs, and then you have the units completed in terms of liters. There were no opening and closing or any whip, but 15,000 were sold at the end of the year. So please calculate the manufacturing cost per liter of the final product. Then record the process cash flow in a general ledger. Let's do this to A and B. Can you guys, I'm going to give you around 15 minutes and then we can then discuss. Is that fine? Can you all see the show we start? Hello? Hi, yes, yes. we are here. Awesome. Yes, you can see. Okay, cool. So just do A and B for me, please, quickly. 15 minutes top. I'm putting on the timer and then we'll discuss then we close off the session for today. Thank you. So it's starting now. Okay, cool. Time is up. How did you guys go about it before I, I start? How did you guys approach it? A, how did you guys approach A? Okay, we had to do the material, the, the cost flows between the two products using material and conversion mm -hmm. to get to your total. And thereafter, it was the T accounts to show the flow of material. Mm -hmm. um, into the production state cost uh, into the production accounts for both the processes and then thereafter the transfer to finished goods and then you got the the cost of sales account mm. but nice. the tricky mm. part of it is the flow from MH to P. You add to close off the production of MH as a flow into production P. Yeah. And then you just add the material and the conversion for production P to get to your total closing. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Cool. 
I like, I like. So let's look at it. So always mention cost of previous processes. You know, all of this that we are doing is going to build up to that equivalent thing that we're going to look at statement. But cost of previous process in MH, nothing. Material given, conversion, cool, total manufacturing, there is. You put that at this age, this is what the cost of per liter would have been. Mm. And then process P, you put in that 83, you put it there, roll it forward, same thing. Then finished product, it's product, you're just adding these ones. Then it will give you the 127. Then, any questions before me on? Okay. It was straightforward. Then, on the GLs, you have to show that, hey, we purchased product material and we issued 35 to MH, we issued to process P. Then conversion cost, same thing. We paid labors 68 and we allocated to MH and to P. It's like telling a story when you're doing a cost flow, eh? especially the GLs. Then you know that if there's a production account, you're showing that, hey, what we issued under material, here it is, it comes under production cost. It shows that it's putting in as an input then the conversion cost, and then this is what's going to production P. Then production P, it has that 83. It has its own material and conversion cost, and your, fin your finished product will have 127. That 127 comes into your finished product to show that it's coming from process P, and what goes to your cost of sales is what you actually sold the 15 plus the 16 rent 36 and that's what you get then the closing balance is the remaining amount cost of sales you show that this is what you got from finished product so it's just the flow of where would it go from here the rolling forward All right any questions on this It will build up, I promise. It will build up as we go. It will build up to now when you start looking at equivalent statements and, and, and. But it's all about grasping the concepts of what is it actually that I'm doing? How does it actually flow into the others? Stuff like that. Principles like that. Once it registers as to Understanding how a consecutive process looks like, how a single process looks like, what we all fighting to get here, it's the unit cost per unit. That's all. But it comes with certain things of processes. Now, because you've seen a process where there's no opening, where there's no percentage of uh, completeness, it's clean. But now we're going to put in those things of saying that there's a percentage of completion here. How much is it so far? We come in and we say there was a normal loss during this whole process of making this copy. How do you take that into account? Actually, there's an abnormal loss. How do you take that into account? How do you do it under when you value your inventory under weighted average? How do you do it when you value under stuff. So what I'm saying is that those nitty gritties come in, but they are all from the whole thing of saying all we want is cost per unit. That's all we want. But there's just these nitty gritties that's coming into play as part of that process costing that you need to take into account to come to that final thing of saying the cost per unit is this. Then we can take it to the income statement now, because you know the cost per unit. You can now say, okay, fine, cost of sales, this is the opening inventory. This is my production cost. 
this is my closing inventory. Because now you just are my normal losses. They need to form as part of this because it's part of the process. This is a normal loss. This is how I put it in my income statement as an expense. Because it's abnormal. So I'm just saying that contextualize that as much as the basis might be easy, we are just building up a bit on them. Might be tricky, but it's not really. It's just understanding what you are doing. So yeah, that's it for today. We covered quite a lot, and I'm happy that it was an interactive um, class. We managed to look at direct and absorption, job costing, and process costing. So it might be too much for people who are even doing fact and who are um, working today. But thank you guys for coming in. And any questions, anything that you would want me to focus on for Saturday or take note of? I think we thank you because I used to hate, it, hate this course, but now with your explanation, explanations and using practical examples it makes us it makes it very easy for us to understand in a way and uh, you know it just puts it into context thank, thank you thank you so much thank you yeah i think i i would i would say that also from my side that i i want to start and continue for a while but i saw that we need to grasp it i need to put I need to understand it pr practical. It's just unfortunate that um, we don't get that exposure of going to a factory and see a whole process costing happening. You know, yeah. when they are baking, when they are making baker's biscuits or whatever, when you see the whole thing with your own eyes, it's easier to grasp. Because when you're in auditing articles, I need to come and still see where the faults are in the process within a matter of two weeks. So I, I saw that, oh, there's the gap that if we were in varsity and we get those opportunities of seeing a whole factory, how it works, it's easier when you're doing questions to visualize. So now we must visualize with things that are closer to us that we know. If you know how to make a dress, you can start thinking about, okay, these are my inputs. This is the conversion. This is the final thing that I have. What am I trying to do here? just trying to get how much does it cost for me to so it's those make those simple examples with things that you know that are tangible then it's easier to build up and see certain principles from different topics as it goes it's a build up but we will be fine we still got time all right thank you guys enjoy the rest of your evening